Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. If you have the ability, stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees. And Richard, will you come take this from me, bro? It's hot up here. So anyways, here you go. Thank you, sir. And let's go before the Lord in prayer tonight. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your goodness. God, we thank you, Lord, that tonight as we approach your word and open it up, that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, tonight, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, the direction, even the correction that we need for our lives. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches that are both preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters, and at no time do we see ourselves as any better than anybody else. But we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in one field, building one kingdom, and that's yours, Lord. So bless all the Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel, Harvest, Oak Valley. Lord, for the well and the way, for Ecclesia and Emmanuel Baptist and Trinity, God. For the assemblies and the four square denominations, for our Catholic and our Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord. For Victory Outreach, all the great churches out there, too many to name by name, Lord. But if they're preaching your gospel, Lord, we bless them tonight as you bless us. God, also one more prayer that I want to say a special prayer for the officer Garcia, God, who's continuing to fight the good fight of faith and, Lord, fighting for his life. We pray in the name of Jesus that you heal him, God. And we thank you, Lord. We pray a prayer of protection over San Bernardino, God. We call it by faith a safe place, God, that the streets will be made livable again, God, that the breach will be restored by the power of the Holy Spirit, God. And we thank you that you're sending saints on assignment as salt and light, God. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said... Amen. You can have a seat. Thank you guys for your continued prayers in those areas, prayers for our city, and uh, my goodness, God is good. Tonight, we're talking about a subject called the blessed life. This is actually part number four in a series, and don't worry if you didn't catch the first parts. Uh, you'll be able to get right up to speed tonight, and this message stands alone. But I've been, uh, anytime I've been teaching at a night service, I've been talking about the blessed life. We've been talking about the Beatitudes. Beatitudes really means the blessed ones, the blessings, right? And, and, and these are things that we ought to have in our lives. They, if you will, they are a be attitude, an attitude that we ought to be, we ought to exemplify in our life. Matthew, the fifth chapter, we're starting in verse number one and reading through verse number 12. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to Matthew, the fifth chapter, and let's kind of review and bring us all back up onto speed where we're at tonight. Matthew, chapter five. Starting in verse number one, Jesus has been traveling. People are all around him. He's doing miracles, signs, and wonders. Matthew chapter five, verse number one. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. I love that because here's Jesus. He, he kind of gets away from the crowd, and now the people who want to be with him come close to him. That's why we come to church. That's why we read our Bibles. That's why we pray. It's because we are his disciples. We are disciplined followers of Jesus Christ, getting away and going after him, trying to find out, Lord, what would you have to say to me? Teach me. Show me your, your way. Show me your character, your nature, your attributes. It says, verse number 2, then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, verse 3, blessed. Everybody say blessed. blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, right away, Jesus starts to shock our thinking. See, we look at the people that are poor, and we say, they're not blessed. No, the wealthy ones are blessed. But Jesus turns our ideas and our thinking upside down. He says, no, blessed are the poor, but where are they poor? Poor, broke down, busted, and disgusted in this world? No, poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's read on. We'll come back and find out what all this means. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn. For they are comforted. Once again, we say mourning. I mean, sorrow, sadness. How is that blessed? But he says, they shall be comforted. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit. The earth will come back to that thought. Bless, number 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Verse number 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Verse number 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Verse 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, let me remind you, 
that the people that are blessed, if we're going to define the word blessed, blessed really means happy. It really means supremely blessed. It is a condition in which congratulations are in order. So when somebody is blessed, you, you almost just want to say, hey, man, I'm so happy for you. Uh, hey, sis, I, I'm just glad to, to see what's going on in your life. Congratulations. That's exciting. I'm so happy for you. See, those are the blessed ones, the people who have the capacity in life to succeed. So when we're talking about the blessed life, we've got to find out what it means. So if we're going to live in this state, what does it mean? How do we live the blessed life? Remember, part number one, we talked about this. Number one, empty yourself. You've got to be poor in spirit. Empty yourself. In other words, you're humbling yourself. You're wholly dependent on God. You can't work your way to salvation. You can't be good enough. You can't be smart enough. You can't be nice enough. You can't do enough. You can't have enough in order to be anything with God. It all comes from God, and it all goes back to God. Any praise that comes our way, we're sending it right to the head. His name is Jesus. And so we are emptying ourselves, and we are relying on God for everything that we are, everything that we have, and everything that we that we ever will be. Secondly, we learned in part number one is that we're to deeply care. We're to mourn. What does that mean? Mourning over our, our sin. Mourning over the, the condition that, that is in the world around us. Mourning and deeply caring enough to do something about it, whether that, that do something means that we repent of our sin, we turn from it, we go away from that wicked way, and we go back to God's way. Or whether it is mourning so much about the the condition of the world and the sin that's out there and the evils that are going on, that we would be moved to pray, moved to get into the face of our Father, moved to talk about it, moved to declare the word and believe in faith for what God would have. Part number two, we talked about this. Number three was be readily submitted to be meek. And you remember, meekness isn't weakness. Meekness is the power that we have under a godly control, that we are readily submitted to the word of the Lord in our life. And then number four, you remember this, have godly desire, not just any old desire, not just led by the flesh, not going after the things of this world. No, we are to hunger and thirst for righteousness, not only the right position with God, but the right will and way of God. And then finally, last time we were together, we talked about this. Number five, be merciful, for you shall obtain mercy. I love that because we all need mercy at times in our life. And therefore, when we extend mercy, when we care about others, when you walk a mile in someone else's shoes and you feel their pain and you recognize and realize, you know what? This is, this is their condition in life. This is what's going on in them. And therefore, you start to extend that love. You start to extend the love of Christ that was given to you. You start to extend, oh, this is a tough one for some of us, forgiveness. Oh, my goodness. I got to forgive now? Yeah. Forgive as God in Christ forgave you. Extend the mercy that was given to you, and you will be given mercy back yourself. And then number six, last time we're together, clean inside. Be pure in heart, unpolluted and undivided. You remember we used those words if you were here Sunday night. Unpolluted. That you're not allowing the spots and the stains of this world. You're not getting near the mud hole because you know people that hang around the mud hole long enough, they'll eventually fall in, right? And therefore, you're keeping yourself not only unspotted, but also undivided. There's nothing taking your attention away from God that you are wholehearted, totally committed to the things of God, to God himself. You're focused on Jesus, looking unto Jesus, and following after him. And you've cleaned up the inside. Now you are pure in heart. Now, today, go back with me in Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse number nine. Take a look at what it says. Verse number nine says this. It says, blessed, everybody say blessed, Blessed. are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, when we take a look at something like this, the peacemakers, what does that really mean to us? Here's here's how I want to express to you what I believe that the word of God is saying. Number seven for tonight is this. Be the solution to the problem. That's what a peacemaker really does, is not only do they make peace, yes, but how do they make peace? How? They're the solution to the problem. In other words, we can look around in our world today, and we can see wars, we can see strife, we can see nation rising up against nation. And there are people who are commending themselves as peacemakers. Why? Because they negotiated a ceasefire for a day or two. See, that to me is not a peacemaker. A peacemaker is one who takes responsibility and they become the solution to the problem. In other words, if if I was at war with somebody, 
I wouldn't be the peacemaker if I just negotiated a ceasefire. No, I would be the peacemaker if I took on myself the responsibility of the problem and made peace. You guys understand the difference? Okay, good. Because it's very essential that we understand what we're talking about as we go into this. Because God, the Bible says, is a God of peace. Isn't that right? He's also the author, the Bible says, of peace. And when it came to the war that we were involved in with him, did you know that before you were a Christian, before you said yes to Jesus, you were at war with God? Oh yeah, Ephesians, the second chapter, if you want to read it on your own time later on, starting about verse uh, 13 through about verse number 15, 16 in there, you'll find out that you were alienated. You weren't a part of the promises. You, you, if you were a Gentile, you were outside and you were at war. There was an enmity that was going on. And so Jesus Christ himself became our peace, the Bible says. He took it upon himself, the responsibility of ending the war. See, the war would have kept going. We would have kept being at odds with God. We would have kept living our lives in a way that was just completely offensive to God. And because of that, God would have completely been against us because God resists the proud, right? Therefore, this would have gone on. Now, we didn't have the power in ourselves to end this war. Why? Because we live in a fallen state. We live in the flesh. And we do not have the power to initiate nor to make happen what needed to happen in order to end the war. So what happens? God, the Father, there in eternity, breaks from his side the Son. And he says, I'm sending you to the earth, and I want you to show them who I am. I want you to reveal my character. I want you to reveal my nature, my attributes. But also, I want you to take on their sin on yourself, and you become the solution to the problem. So Jesus comes. He lives the perfect, spotless sinless life. He lives a life in unity with God. He lives a life open before man. You remember the story there? Jesus is turned over to be crucified, and there on that cross, he gives up his spirit to God, and he fulfills and abolishes the law and the war and the enmity that was dividing us from him, and he himself became our peace. Now, see, that leaves us an example to follow that if God is my God, and if Jesus is the perfect Man, then if I'm going to follow anybody, I'm going to follow Christ, right? And I'm going to follow Christ's example because he left me the perfect example. So that means when there is enmity, when there's something wrong, when there's a war, when there's a problem, I now am the solution to that problem. Are you listening? See, I, I think in our modern day society, we've got this mentality like, you know what, I, I, even though I may be wrong, I'm still right. You know what I'm saying? There's that, that attitude. There's that uh, moxie, if you will, that bravado. Kind of like, you know what? I'm not going to say sorry to nobody. They don't owe me nothing because they don't pay my rent. And, you know, I, I'm, just, I'm just doing my thing over here. And if you don't like it, you know, that's just how it's going to be. And yet, what if God had that attitude towards us? We'd be headed for hell right now. And yet God said, I'm not leaving you in that state. Even though God would have been just sending every single one of us to hell. I mean, think about that for a second. He would have been right to send everyone on the planet to hell. Why? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, the Bible says, not one. And you remember in Genesis, it says the heart has been on evil continually to do it all day long. And yet God is grieved with the death of the unrighteous. And therefore, God loved us so much, he wouldn't leave us in the state that we were in. He was moved with compassion when he saw us in our fallen state, and he saw that we were at war railing against him, and he said, no, I love you enough that I'm going to take the sin of the world on myself. Jesus took it on the cross. He took the wrath of God, the punishment for our sin that was stored up for sin, took it upon himself. I mean, my goodness, no one, no one, no one knows what that felt like. No one knows the suffering. That's why Jesus cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he was taking on the sin of the world and the Father for the first time had broken his fellowship with him. That communion, that unity for the first time was ever broken off from the Father. That's how much God loved us is he would suffer and he would die and he would be buried just for us. But now that he's raised again to life, he himself becomes our peace. Now the gospel that's preached to us is a gospel of what? Peace. peace. It's the gospel of peace. So that means there's good news for us that we don't have to be at that war anymore. Why? Because God took the initiative, broke down the wall that was separating us from him, and now he leaves us an example to follow. So if we're going to be peacemakers, 
then we need to follow Christ's example. Turn with me to the book of Romans, if you will. Keep your finger there in Matthew chapter 5. We'll go back there in a moment if you have a ribbon or something like that. Leave that there in your Bible. And let's take a look at what it means to be a peacemaker. Romans chapter number 12. Let's start there. Romans chapter number 12. Great verse in the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 12. And in fact, if you're looking at how to make peace, read the chapter of Romans number 12. The reason why is because we don't have time to get into everything that's said in this, in this chapter, but there are verse upon verse upon verse upon verse of instructions, quick little things that you can incorporate into your life that will help you to be a better peacemaker as well as a better Christian, okay, dealing with others. Romans chapter 12, verse number 18, are you there? A couple of you guys are Romans chapter 12, verse number 18, are you there? Yeah. All right, praise the Lord. Look at what it says. If it is possible, everybody say if. See, now that means it could or it could not, right? If it is possible, look at the next part, as much as depends on the other person, your job, society, the politicians, who? You, that's me, right? As much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. See, that means that really the responsibility for making peace, if it is possible, as much as depends on me. We gotta take this personally. We have to take peace personally. See, as Christians, we should have peace. Why? Because Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and now Jesus says, my peace I give you, and I don't give as the world gives. Jesus says, I give to you, and I, and, I, and I leave my peace with you, that your joy may be full. So Jesus has given each and every one of us Christians peace, and if you're ever in turmoil, ever having problems, you just go to the Prince of Peace, and you cast your care on him, you leave that at his feet, and you receive your peace. But if you're going on the job and somebody's got a problem, you're the solution, as much as depends on you. Is that right? See, that's what the Bible says. If it is possible, there's times where it's not possible. So what do you do? Do what you can, okay? But if it is possible, do what you can. Are you listening? That means that if all that needs to happen is you need to go say sorry. Oh, I'm meddling somebody's business now. (laughs) You need to go say sorry. How about this? If all that needs to happen is you just zip your lip, Mm-hmm. You know what I said right there? And throw away the key? You remember that as a child? You zip the lip and then throw away the key? You might need to do that. Why? Because if that's what it's going to take to bring peace. But I've got to say something. I just can't stand by. Well, listen, is it a salvation issue? Sometimes, hello, sometimes our talking keeps people from salvation because they go, I don't want to have anything to do with that Christian or their church or their religion. See, they just proved my point right there. See, as much as depends on you, if it's possible, if it's not, then hey, live your life. Live a godly life. Do what you can. Say sorry, forgive, ask for forgiveness, talk, don't talk, whatever you need to do. If you need to make restoration, if you need to go and pay the loan back, if you need to extend some loving kindness, maybe you need to to get involved in their situation, maybe you need to go back to some of these other points like being merciful, maybe you need to walk a while in their shoes so that you can empathize with them and they can feel comfortable knowing that you know their pain. See, if it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Charles Spurgeon said, one sure way of peacemaking is to let the fire of contention alone. Somebody's mad at you, leave it alone. Neither fan it, nor stir it, nor add fuel to it, but let it go out by itself. I love this next sentence. Listen to this. Begin your ministry with one blind eye and one deaf ear. I love that. Going into work. Going to the family gathering. What's up? How you doing? Yeah, he's good, huh? All right. Why? Because you don't have to get all riled up, especially when the people aren't saved. Can I, can I just let you know this? Sinner's going to sin, right? So why are you getting mad at them? They haven't received Jesus yet. Christians, you know what? If everybody's got their walk to maturity. 
So let's not judge and criticize and condemn people to death. Let's love people to life, bringing them onto maturity. Hey, let me talk to you about it. Let me show you, hey, you know what? I had a similar problem. Let me, let me tell you about how God led me on a path of restoration and healing in this area. See, if we would extend ourselves as much as possible, live at peace with all men, my goodness, Church would have a better rep. We would have a better rep. We, we would have more people filling the sanctuary, filling up the seats. I, I believe there would be revival. Really, I do. You're there in Romans 12. Turn with me to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Now, a couple pages over. Verse number 19. Talking about eating meat versus eating vegetables. Somebody's got a weak conscience. Somebody's got a strong conscience. People are getting mad over it. That's, you know, given to idols. Don't eat it if it's given to idols. But you know what? Just sit there and eat it. If you don't know, just eat it because they place it in front of you for conscience sake, for your conscience, for their conscience. You know, and he's going through all this stuff. And right in the middle of these thoughts on that, Romans chapter 14, verse number 19, look at what he says. Romans chapter 14, verse number 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which we may edify or build up one another. See, the issue is not vegetarian, meat eater, carnivorous, omnivore, herbivore. That's not the issue. The issue is let us pursue the things which make for peace. Why? Because we are peacemakers. We're following Jesus. Jesus sat down at the table with sinners, loved on them. Why? Because he was making peace. He was extending the love of God and the grace of God to people who didn't deserve it. And that's what we're doing in our life as we make for peace. So uh, I've got another quote for you. Richard Baxter is a Quaker. Uh, he said this, he, is, he that is not a son of peace is not a son of God. All other sins destroy the church consequentially, but division and separation demolish it directly. Ooh. Wow. That means that when you start dividing the church, when you start going against your brother or your sister, now you are coming against the church of Almighty God. And what makes us think we're going to have God on our side when we're breeding division, frustration, discord in the church? We need to sow the right seed in our life. We need to sow the right seed in this church. Need to love one another and extend ourselves for one another. So what makes peace? Well, overlooked offenses makes peace. Love covers the multitude of sins. How about this? Turning the other cheek, as Jesus said and did. How about this? Not repaying evil for evil, but good for evil. See, these are all things that we know, and yet, are we really pursuing peace in our lives? I, I, I got to be honest with you, I don't always pursue peace. There's times where, you know, I just get that little wild hair, and I just need to say something, you know, and I just got to say it. It's just wrong. It's not right. Listen, if I would shut my mouth and make for peace, you know, it'd be a lot more peaceful life for me and for the other people. What else makes for peace? How about this? Blessing and not cursing. Somebody curses you on the freeway, rah, 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 rah. Sorry. Slow down and get away from them. You know what I mean? You don't need that aggravation and that frustration. Oh, I like this one. Praying for our enemies. That makes for peace. See, because you may win your enemy by prayer, whereas you won't by arguing. I like what uh, Pastor Jim's dad used to tell him. You can win the argument but lose the sale. Think about that for a second. You might be able to go up against somebody and, and argue Darwin or argue, you know, science or argue creation or argue any of this kind of stuff. You can win the argument, but you can lose the sale. See, we need to be wise. We need to be savvy in our lives. And we need to be peacemakers. Jesus often engaged people who he could have won the argument. He could have said, you're a downright rotten, dirty sinner. It would have been justified in doing it, but they would have ended up hating him and walking away from him. What did he do? He revealed himself. He spoke tenderly. He, he oftentimes used stories and illustrations. He, 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 he took time with people, sat with people, got in their shoes, and he made peace. He was a peacemaker. See, I love the promise that comes with this one, blessed are the peacemakers, because the Bible says that we shall be called the sons of God. Really, that sons word is, is really a better word for that is the children of God. You'll find that in the old King James Version. The children of God. Now, 
Why would that happen? See, because we, oftentimes when we think about somebody calling us the, the children of God, we think that, that that would be people out on the outside, right? Or maybe people in the church will see us making peace or our family or, you know, our, our neighbors, our coworkers, and they'll start calling us, well, that's a son of God right there. They're a peacemaker. But can I tell you something? They're probably not going to recognize that and notice that. The one who's going to call us sons of God is God himself. Why? Because he sees the image of his son on the inside of us. And I don't care, I don't want, I don't need the praises of man. No, I want the praises of God. I want to put a smile on God's face. I want to be pleasing to my father. And if my father looks at me and says, that's my son, hey, I've done my job. Why? Because now I look like Jesus. He sees the image of his son in me when I'm a peacemaker. My goodness, that's what this is all about. So, be the solution to the problem. Be a peacemaker. Number eight, turn back with me to Matthew, fifth chapter. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Last one for tonight, last one for this series is this. Matthew, the fifth chapter. We're going to start in verse. Let me get there myself. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse number 10. Look at what it says, verse 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Everybody say blessed. blessed. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I want you to notice something. The poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, God knows what he's saying, and he knows that he's repeating himself, and he's giving us an emphasis. He's telling us something that... This is a promise to all of us who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. In other words, if you're persecuted because you did the wrong thing, then you received it justly and you don't have the kingdom on your side. But when you do the will of God the right way, when you do God's way, the will of God, the way of God, now you are being persecuted for what? Righteousness' sake. That means that you are wrongfully persecuted. Now, all of a sudden, yours is the kingdom of heaven. You have all of the backing of heaven, all of the economy, all of the army. Everything that you need is at your disposal. That's at your resource now. Now, look at this. Verse number 11. Blessed. Everybody say blessed. Blessed, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now, again, Jesus is saying something that at the time they don't understand. Remember, this is before Jesus went to the cross. And Jesus is flipping their understanding upside down. See, we think when people praise us and tell us how nice we are and how, how good we look and all that kind of stuff, if people are, are, are saying good things to you, then you're blessed. No, Jesus says, blessed are you when they revile you. That means that they're shaming you. They're making you feel bad by their words and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. In other words, they're lying on you. So he says, if they say stuff that's false about you, for my sake. Again, not for if you did the wrong thing. Because otherwise your punishment is just. And you're receiving what your actions sowed. But when it's for Jesus, that's a totally different story. Why? Verse number 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Now, again, we're kind of scratching our heads going, I, I don't understand. People are talking about me. They're reviling me. They're making me feel bad about myself. And, and they're persecuting me. And I'm supposed to rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Why would I do that? Here's why. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, now Jesus is speaking to a Jewish culture. And they respected and honored those who had gone before, especially the prophets. Because the prophets brought to them an understanding about God. They represented God to the people. And therefore, when he says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, that right there would have been enough. But then he goes on to add, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In other words, you're in good company. You're among the right side. You're on the right side. You're among the right people. You've linked up with the right family when that happens. In other words, you are now identifying with Jesus himself who was persecuted as well as all the prophets who have gone before. You're on the right team. You're doing the right thing. So what does this mean to us when we see this? Number eight, last one for tonight is this. Stay the course. Stay the course. See, it's a highway of holiness that we walk as Christians. Narrow is the path, and there are few who find it. Wide is the way that leads to destruction. 
So church, if you're on the path, if you're on that narrow path, if you're, if you're going to find that, that narrow gate, stay the course, church. Doesn't matter what comes against you. Doesn't matter the persecution that rises up. Doesn't matter the evil that's spoken of you. Doesn't matter if they lie on you. Church, you stay the course because great is your reward in heaven and you're on the right team. You're on the right side. You're in the right family. That's what this is all about. See, in our society, in our culture of comfort, we often forget. Or we don't even know the persecutions that are currently going on in our world today. I heard a stat one time that in the last, I believe it was 10 years, I'm probably completely misquoting the stat, but in the last 10 years, there were more people killed for their Christianity and for their faith in Jesus Christ than all the years prior combined. That's staggering. May have been the last hundred years, but even at that, you think about how long it's been since Jesus went to the cross. That's staggering. Presently, our, our, our news has brought this reality into plain sight for all of us. And not only do we need to pray for those people and encourage those people, and, and, and you know, the, the Bible even says to pray for the people that are locked up in prisons as if we were chained with them. That's really the responsibility we have. We need to be in prayer for our brothers and sisters around the world that are being persecuted. But what should we do? Should we, should we fear? Should we run and hide? Oh no, they're going to get us. No, listen, we should stay the course. This is just part of the Christian life. Now, I know this isn't very encouraging, you know, when you start talking about persecution as part of life and part of the Christian life especially, but I, I want you to know this, that this is not something strange. The Bible says, don't be looking around like something weird is happening to you, some strange thing because of the fiery trial, but everyone all over the world is going through the same struggles. Why? Because there's a devil out there that hates you, and there's a world system that's against you, and therefore, you're going to have persecutions. 2 Timothy chapter 3, I want you to see this in your Bible, okay, so that you know that I'm not just saying this. You got you to see this in your Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 12. Look at this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 12. Take a look at what it says. 2 Timothy 3.12 says this, Yes, and all, everybody say all. all. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. Stop right there. Stop right there. Look up at me. How many of you desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus? Okay. Now let's look at the next couple of words. Will suffer persecution. It's just part of the Christian walk. This is just part of life. I would submit to you, if you're not ruffling some feathers... If you're not rattling some cages, come on, somebody. If there's not somebody getting mad because you took a stand, then you might need to step it up a notch or two. Now, remember, I just talked about living peaceably with all men, okay? I just talked about being the solution to the problem, and I just talked about our witness. But when it comes to the things of God in our life, if you want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. It's going to happen. Just hold on long enough, stay the course long enough, and on that road, it's marked with sufferings and pain. Why? Because you're following Jesus, and his road was marked with suffering and pain. St. Augustine said this. He said, God had one son on earth without sin, but never one without suffering. Let me say that again. God had one son on earth without sin, speaking of Jesus, but never had one without suffering. In other words, all of us. All of us are going to go through trials. All of us are going to go through problems. And if we're going to live the godly life in Christ Jesus, we will suffer persecution. may not be like our brothers and sisters around the world. It may not be the same way. But guess what? There's going to be people who are mad at you, people who don't like you, people who will try and maybe even succeed at getting you to lose your job because of your faith. There's going to be people that speak evil against you and start talking about you behind your back. There's going to be people that come against you and raise up and cause family members and, and friends and people that will, will, will just rise up and gossip and slander and, and say all sorts of evil things against you because you're a Christian. It's going to happen. But be of good cheer because great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets. John chapter number 15, last verse for tonight. John chapter 15. Turn there with me. Book of John chapter number 15. 
Jesus is headed to the cross and he's speaking to his disciples, talking to them about what's going to take place, what's going to happen. John chapter 15, verse number 20, look at what he says. John chapter 15, verse number 20. Remember the word that I said to you. Jesus is reminding them of something that he taught them. A servant is not greater than his master. So he says, remember when I said that to you guys? Here's what it means. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. But look at the other side. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Why? Because we now identify with Jesus He's the captain of our salvation. He's gone out before us. Listen, if Jesus can go through the suffering and persecution and trial that he went through, if he can go to the cross, take on the sin of the world, die, and be raised again to life, now seated at the right hand of God, we can look to our reward in heaven. See, that's why we can rejoice and be exceedingly glad. That's why we can smile each and every day, even if we're facing persecutions. Why? Because we don't look to this life for comfort. It's not about what I have here on the earth. It's not about the stuff. Listen, you don't get to take any of it with you. Can I just let you in on the secret? You can be buried in the Cadillac, but the Cadillac stays, you go. You can keep your gold teeth, the gold teeth stay, you go. You can wear the rings and all that, but listen, it's going to stay, and eventually it's all going to burn up when Jesus comes back anyways. It's just dirt. It's just something here on earth that God gives us to use for the kingdom and the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we don't look to this life for comfort. We look to our reward in heaven. God himself, Jesus Christ, he is our sun and our shield and our exceeding great reward. He's the one that when we go to heaven, he's there with open arms ready to receive us to himself saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of our Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We don't have to worry. Stay the course, church. What did we learn in this series? How to live the blessed life. First of all, we learned empty yourself. Be poor in spirit. Secondly, deeply care. Mourn. Let it move you to repent or move you to pray or move you to act. Number three, be readily submitted. Be meek, not weak. Meek. Readily submitted to the things of God. Power under control. Number four, have godly desire, hunger, and thirst after righteousness. Number five, be merciful. As you do, you will receive mercy. Number six, clean inside. Be pure in heart, unpolluted, and undivided. Number seven, tonight, be the solution to the problem. Be a peacemaker. As much as it depends on you, pursue those things. Number eight, stay the course. Blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Did you guys get some from the word of the Lord tonight from this series? Come on, let's give God a great big praise. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, I want to talk to you guys before you leave. Make sure that you're right with God. It'd be a tragedy coming to the house of God. Sing songs. Feel the presence of the Lord. Listen to the word of the Lord. We had a great time. You guys were wonderful tonight. It'd be a tragedy if we did all that. Then we let you go and you got out to your car. You started your car and your heart stopped and you died. God forbid that should happen to anyone in this place. But what if? Let's just ask that question. Just answer the question in your heart. No, 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 the answer, but you and God. What if tonight was your last night here on the earth? Would you end up in heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in your heart. No, 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 the answer, but you and God. Now, let's examine your answer because your answer tells a lot about where you're at with God. Sometimes people say, well, I, I don't really believe in hell, so I guess by default I'll go to heaven because, you know, hell's not real. That's like a fairy tale. But you know that hell is spoken of all throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament. In fact, Jesus himself talked about hell. It's a very real place. It was never intended for you and I. It was made for the devil and his angels who rebelled against God. But we can choose with our life while we're here on the planet where we go, whether to heaven or whether we go to hell. It's a very real place. You're not going to get out of it just by burying your head in the sand and denying existence. You're going to have to face the reality of it. Now, sometimes people say, well, you know, I, I'm going to go to heaven because all roads lead to heaven. You know, that's why Jesus went to the cross is so that everybody could go to heaven. And, and you know, God sees our lives and says, you know, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do, whatever this church over here wants to do, and the, this group over there, whatever they want to do, everybody's going to go to heaven. We just, just do your thing and you get to go. Now, do you think that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, went to the cross, beaten, bloody, a public spectacle for all to see? You think he went through all that suffering, all that trial, 
all that beating, all that scorning. I think he went through all that, and then afterwards he says, yeah, whatever you want to do, just live however you want to live. And, and, you know, whatever they say over there, that's cool for them. If that's how they want to do it, I'll just see everybody. You think that God would do that? No. He tells us exactly get, how to get to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? It means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Now, sometimes people say, well, that's good news, Pastor, because I know God's way is by being good. I've been a really good person. You know, I used to be bad, cleaned up my act, now I'm good. I've done a lot of good deeds in my life, gave money to charities, helped out in social justice causes, and, and been a really nice person to my neighbors and my family, and therefore, I think I'm going to get to go to heaven. I think my good outweighs my bad, and so, you know, I'm going to get into heaven because I've been good. So you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can be good enough to get into heaven? It doesn't work like that. You can't be good enough to get to heaven, because like we talked about tonight, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not going to make it there on your own merit. Can't be good enough to get into heaven. Sometimes people say, well, I was raised in church. Parents told me you're Christians growing up. Hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized a Christian as a child? You went to religious classes like Sunday school or Sabbath school, maybe catechism class. And you're born in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven denying hell, Right? wrong. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible? Check it out. Nowhere does it say because your parents raise you in church and tell you you're a Christian that makes you a Christian. Nor does it say wear religious jewelry, be baptized or Christian as a child, go to religious classes or be born in America that that gets you right with God and gets you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. And nowhere do I see in the Bible that because you're not some other religion that by default God loves you in the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Tonight, can I love you enough, respect you enough and honor you enough to tell you the truth? You're not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get there. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am sitting in church right now. I'm sitting in front of you. And, and I consider myself to be a Christian. That's great. I'm glad you're here tonight. Just show that to me in the Bible where you sit in a church service. Call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. It doesn't work like that. That's like me going down to Dodger Stadium, all you Dodger fans. Me going down to Dodger Stadium, sitting in the dugout, wearing the uniform, bringing my bat and my ball, and thinking that I'm going to get to play in the game. Listen, they're going to find me sitting there, drag me out and lock me up. Why? Because I'm not a dodger. In the same way, you can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Now, sometimes people say, well, hold on a second, Pastor. You don't understand. My last church, I got involved. I helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church, taught in the Bible classes. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. Just, just show that to me in the Bible, your church involvement, singing in the choir, helping out, making decisions. People think of you as a leader. Carry the pastor's Bible or teaching the Bible classes, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. God is not standing at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. It doesn't work like that. You say, but okay, pastor, I get all that, but I know God. Someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I know about Jesus. Celebrate Easter and the resurrection. Sing the songs at Christmas every year of my life. Doesn't that mean that I'm, I'm a Christian? Because, I, I mean, I could quote scriptures, Pastor. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? Problem with that, if you'd read your Bible, you'd know the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head. Not about you having mental assent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is. And that gets you right with God, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. But rather, this is about your heart. Jesus, speaking to a religious leader of his day, said, you must be born again. It wasn't about his good deeds. It wasn't about his upbringing in church. It wasn't about his being a religious leader and knowing who God was. He said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's raked that term through the coals. They made it out to be some weirdo, goofy thing. But listen, let's not let society define for us what being born again means. Let's let the Bible decide for us what that means. What does it really mean to be born again? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are pretty gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he talking about, lukewarm? What's that? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again, occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything, and you're not opposed to God. 
but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three, just like this. One, two, three. And when I say the word three, I'm going to pop my hands together, just like this. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that. Bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. Let's get past that embarrassment tonight. Because think of the trade-off. Wouldn't it, better to be, wouldn't it be better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. No one's that dumb. And yet the devil thinks that you are. That's why he's trying to talk you out of it right now. Come on, push past that embarrassment. Tell the devil to go jump in a fiery lake. You're going on with God tonight. Get ready to get your hands up. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, better than ending up in hell. And Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. Sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right. Or you can give God all your heart. You can give God all of your life in this safe and friendly church service. We're all rooting for you. We're all excited for you. No one's judging you, criticizing you, or condemning you. We've all done this at one time or another in one way or another. Now it's your turn. We give God all of your heart. We give God all of your life. Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, giving them all of your heart and life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, and you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it, you can get right with God in a moment by simply raising your hand. Acknowledging your need for Jesus. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online. Hey, you can raise your hand. God is watching you. And then click the button that says respond to God or go to our homepage where it says how to know God. Someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Raise them up high right now for me. No, don't clap. Let me see any hands. Where are you at? Thank you. There's one, two. Up in the family room, there's three, four. Thank you. God bless you. Up here, there's five. Thank you. God bless you. Who else? Five, six, seven. Thank you. God bless you. Eight, nine. Thank you. Gotcha. Up there. Nine wise people. Where are you at? Number 10. Just raise it up high when I'm looking your direction. Anybody else real quick? About nine wise people. Anybody else real quick? Come on, number 10. You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. I'll, I'll let you in on that one. If you feel the Spirit of God tugging at your heart right now, come on. Just respond to Him. If that's you, just raise your hand up right now. Come on, number 10, let's go. Pop it up when I'm looking your direction. Anybody else? Okay, forget 10. Number 11, you're just sitting there saying, I, I was waiting for that other guy, but I can't wait any longer. Come on now. Pop it up. Where are you at? Come on, if that's you, just raise it up high for me. All right. No one else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for nine wise people. Hallelujah. All right. All nine of you or number 10, number 11, you know you should have done this. Hey, it's not too late. Here's what we're going to do. We're all going to stand in a moment. We're all going to give a clap and a shout. Elijah's going to sing a song. As we do that, that's your cue to stand up. Get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. We can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand. Let's all stand and welcome them. You come right now. Just make your way to the front. For the family rooms, you can bring your children. Come on down. Come on, come on. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. So you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. On, you can come too. Jesus, I believe in you. You raised your hand or you should have. Jesus, come on down right now. I belong to you. You can come too. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I breathe. Come on now. Jesus, you raise your hand or if you should have, you just make your way to the front. We'll wait for you. Just come on down right now from the family rooms. Come on. You can bring your children right now. They're welcome.
Everybody else, just make your way to the front right now because they're still coming. We'll wait for you. We'll wait for you. They're still coming. Come on down. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. Come on from the foyer. If you raised your hand to the foyer, come on down. Come on down. Jesus, I believe. All right, they're still coming. Jesus, I Amen. All right. Praise God. So glad that you guys all came. This is the best decision of your entire life right here, okay? Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. When I introduce you guys, when I introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right ear left, this is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really cool guy. Nothing weird's gonna go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? You know, are they gonna wear funky clothes? I'm about as weird as it's gonna get tonight, okay? And you already got past me, okay? He's cool. All right, he's gonna do three things with you. I'm gonna let you know what they are in advance so that you're not afraid, going, oh, what are these people doing with me? He's just gonna lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Prayer is talking to God. You're gonna welcome Jesus in. You're gonna be born again, okay? That's what you wanted to do is have everlasting life with God, following Jesus, giving your heart and life to Jesus. You're gonna do that right now. Gonna be born again, headed for heaven, denying your presence now. Secondly, he's gonna give you some free information, some free literature to find out what to do next in your walk with God, okay? It's easy reading. It's free. Take it home, read about it, and it will encourage you and give you a, a heading, a direction. Okay, now that I'm a Christian, what do I do next? Thirdly, He's going to give you what we call a spiritual personal trainer. Heard of a physical trainer? The gym helps you get strong, right? Okay. Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. It's five weeks, okay? It's easy. It's free. He'll tell you how it works, and then he'll let you come right back out. Now, let me make a promise to you guys. Give us a year, one year of your life, sitting under the teaching here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center consistently. If you can get in once a week, twice a week, Oh, how about this? Three times a week. We've got 11 church services a week just for you guys. We're here working hard for you. So get in as much as you can consistently after that year and for the rest of your life. I promise you will be so blessed like we talked about. Congratulations are in order for you guys. Why? Because you'll say, I never knew it could be this good. Am I telling the truth, everybody? Take their word for it, all right? If you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior, I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.